Nigeria has had over 11 successive and consistent quarters of growth since its exit from recession and the exchange rate in the last four years also remained stable until the global effects of COVID-19. Reserves are $42.5 billion, up from $23 billion in October 2016. This was not a fluke. These are the results of planned, deliberate and effective actions of the rescue team assembled by Nigeria's President Mohamedou Buhari. For every member of Buhari's government, the goal is to deliver dividends with proof, proof of real and verifiable achievements. I recall that the president and our government were concerned about the state of the national economy, levels of inequality and challenges that ordinary Nigerians had in getting business done, transport and related infrastructure. So we evolved an economic recovery and growth plan with the hope of using that to galvanize the economy to meet the expectations of Nigerians in terms of producing employment, producing food, and getting on with business. I think about a week after our inauguration, the president asked me to meet with him in his office, and uh, he was particularly concerned about the Ilori Jeba Road, the link between northern and southwest Nigeria, a major transport artery for food, petroleum products, construction materials, and so many other things. The road had essentially given way between Ilori and Jeba. It used to take about seven days to complete that journey from Sokoto to Lagos. The road was just not passable. It wasn't unmotorable, it was unpassable. And he was also concerned about the Abuja Kano Highway, the second Niger Bridge, and the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. And what were the obstacles and what my recommendations would be to get those projects back on track? If the president left us a free hand to evolve policies and programs for the ministry as we considered auspicious and sensible within the framework of the economic recovery and growth plan. A budget of 261 billion naira will not be enough, but the Buhari administration will prioritize, slow down and halt new projects while concentrating on completing roads that drive the economic and agricultural movements such as the Enugu Port Harcourt Road and Suleja Sukutu Road. The first achievement was to revive all the existing road contracts that we inherited, what was needed to get the contractors back to work because many contractors had been laid off at the time. There were no payments to contractors. Budget for roads across Nigeria was barely 18 billion. We got a budget for 250 something billion approved for 2016. The feedback is the young men working on the construction site we've been visiting and inspecting. One of the construction companies bought 600 tires in one day because we paid. Demand for bitumen and petroleum products went up. These numbers correspond in the quarterly National Bureau of Statistics report. An activity in works has a knock-on effect on mining, building materials, sand, granite. Construction companies pays its suppliers, supply iron road, supply cement, to start producing sand, to start producing aggregates, sharp sand, laterite. Those numbers continue to rise. Part of the reason why you have consecutive quarter growths. The road out of recession. The second thing is that travel time started to reduce. Roads like Ore, Bini, Shagamu, people used to sleep on that road as they used to on Lagos Ibaro. Clearly the conversation is when are you going to finish the road? Many parts of the road are verifiably now better, more terrible than they were before. People are spending a little time on the road longer than they wish because the road is under construction. The Ilori Jeba that was a seven day journey is now a one and a half hour journey through 190 kilometers. We are now dualizing the road but commuters can drive through, expanding it to Mokwa, going towards Kaduna, keeping the economy going, moving agro-produce from the north and moving goods from ports, petroleum products across the country. And all of these are interconnected. In spite of difficult financial situations, President Buhari remains committed. 
there are at least 525 projects going on simultaneously across the nation. But bad weather conditions remain a critical factor, slowing down some projects. The second Niger Bridge, structures are now out from under the water. We we'll spend about 5 billion naira a month there. There were over a thousand plus people employed there. Same thing on the Abuja Kaduna Highway. Also, Bodo Boni. Work is going on on that road now. Before 2015, when people complained that there was no federal presence in our state, the story now is we want more. There is no state where we are not building at least one road. We are also building federal secretariats in states that were created from previous states who felt that well, they deserve to have their secretariat as a measure of the quality of states. So we are in Ikiti, Bayelsa, Zamfara, Gombe, Nasarawa, and Anambra. We're we are also intervening in about 43 universities now in their internal road network. These have been left for decades. We have completed, I think, about 20 nationwide. It's galvanizing the construction industry. Artisans, suppliers, food vendors go back to work. It is also supporting the agro industry because we are also targeting roads from mining areas, from big agro centers that lead from the port to evacuate goods, so you will see us along Barrow Port on Apapa Urushoki Expressway, on Enugu Portacot Road because that's the road to the port, and Calabar E2, and uh, Alessi you get trying to also evacuate the Calabar Port because all of those ports connect to the north of the country and vice versa. As at October 2019, the Ministry of Works and Housing, through its reference document, reveals there are 67 ongoing projects in the Southeast Geopolitical Zone, Abia 12, Anambra 19, Ebony 4, Enugu 21, Imo 11. The Enugu Portacot Road is the signature road that connects all of the five states of the southeast with the second Niger bridge. We are building houses in all the five states of the southeast because they all give us land. We also have a federal secretariat in Oka nearing completion in the intervention for schools. We make sure in batch one, if it's 10, at least there is one that goes to each zone. If it's 20, there is at least two that goes to each zone. Same thing in bridge repairs, maintenance. We try to ensure some equity. Directly under our pilot housing project, we are in 34 states that gave us land. Indirectly, we are in many other more states through a combination of the Federal Housing Authority and Federal Mortgage Bank because the bank lends money to people who want to buy and build houses. Couple of housing projects that have been completed or nearing completion in many parts of the country. In 2012, President Buhari said, quote, If I was president, I would have the courage to jail anyone involved in scams or who steals or takes public funds from the Treasury, whether it is in the local government, state government, or central bank of Nigeria. End of quote. Corruption remains Nigeria's challenge. We all have a moral body and responsibility for the corruption war. From prosecution to recovery to prevention, Nigeria's Economic and Financial Crimes Commission made giant strides from 2015 to 2019. Acting Chairman Ibrahim Magu attributes the success of the EFCC since 2015 to the determination of President Buhari to fight corruption to a standstill. The activities of the anti-corruption agencies in Nigeria have been remarkable since the inception of this administration in 2015. And this is a reflection of President Muhammadu Buhari's determination to completely eradicate corruption in Nigeria. The achievement of the ESC, for instance, have been very tremendous. The tireless effort of the commissions, officers and men, culminated in discovering multiple convictions and recovery of funds and properties was billions of naira. The conviction secured by the commission since the beginning of this administration reflect a positive progression. In 2015, the Commission secured 103 convictions. In 2016, 194. 2017, 189. 2018, 312 convictions. From January to date, we had 406 convictions. Despite this record, 
Corruption remains a challenge in our country. I believe that the fight against corruption requires a multi-stakeholder approach. Institutional mechanism alone will not eradicate corruption. We must have the passion and the will to make a difference. On 28 March 2015, President Buhari said, if Nigerians failed to kill corruption, corruption would kill Nigeria. In the fight against corruption, since President Buhari was sworn in, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission has achieved convictions and recoveries, all real and verifiable. When you tell somebody we got 56 houses forfeited from former Minister of Petroleum Resources, Daisy Ani Alison Madweke. The physical buildings, we need to bring them for people to see. And that's why I have all the properties that we secured from Madweke. And all those properties have been forfeited. This building is in Banana Island, Bella Vista, the most expensive from the one we got. So everything here was from Daisy Ani. In addition to five boxes of jewellery, we discovered in our house during the execution of a search warrant, we got boxes worth over $5 million, mostly diamonds and gold, exotic jewellery. This brings it to the people. Now you can relate with what the situation is. When we discovered the properties, we took the matter to court. An interim order was initially secured, and we now got a final forfeiture to forfeit all this to the federal government. Now, as far as advanced fee fraud is concerned, the EFCC is also deploying technology and intelligence to deal with cyber crime. We came up with Operation Cyberstorm for us to use technology and intelligence to track advanced fee fraudsters, mostly cyber crime criminals, who we normally call Yahoo Yahoo boys, and most of the intelligence and the technological efforts to came with results. We have over 300 convictions from cybercrime alone, from internet fraud alone. These are the properties we got from them, exotic cars, buildings. Then we found a cash of $500,000 during one of the searches we conducted. We're clamping down on Yahoo Yahoo boys. The EFCC was also able to get closure on the alleged siphoning of over $2 billion in the arms deal of former National Security Advisor Sambu Dasuki. In this particular area, we're able to get the conviction of late Alex Vade's properties, some in Abuja. In addition, we found in his wardrobe $1 million in cash during the execution of a search warrant. The $1 million that has also been forfeited to the federal government, in addition to those buildings, we also secured the forfeiture of over 2 billion naira belonging to Amosu. That's in money okay. and properties. We've secured a a couple of convictions. Top on the list of that was that of the former governor of Plateau State, Joshua Daria, and Jolie Nyama, the former governor of Taraba State. They got 14 years each, but was finally reduced. The commission has extradited Nigerians to various countries for different offenses. Like Franka Semata was extradited to the United Kingdom for engaging in human trafficking. And Keke Weyaku, he was extradited to the United Kingdom for an offense he committed 14 years ago and ran to Nigeria. So the EFCC investigated him for identity fraud. We arrested him and they discovered that he was even on a wanted list in the UK for a murder he committed 14 years ago. So the EFCC was able to get him extradited back to the United Kingdom. And this is the managing director of Ontario Oil and Gas Limited, Walter Wagbasana. He also backed 10 years imprisonment. Still talking about subsidy fraud, Jibri Rawai also backed 10 years imprisonment. We secured this conviction. 17 persons were prosecuted and convicted, sentenced for illegal dealing in oil products. And Joseph Mubike, former senior advocate of Nigeria, convicted for perversion of justice. And Kabi State former Attorney General was also convicted for a fraud of over 1.6 billion naira. These are some of the cash we recovered from the raid we conducted in Lagos in Balogu markets. It's 250 million naira in cash. Before now, the EFCC usually carry out raids on fraudster hideouts. Most of them use shrines to deceive unsuspecting victims. And they tie them down to so many death threats and charms and all that. And they use that to extort money from them. The EFCC destroyed most of their shrines and it created a lot of awareness for people to know most of these things are just film tricks. They're not real. For example, if they take you to a shrine and you see some of these things, you know, these things could be real. They were created by people to deceive. They don't have any powers fraudulent activities and fraudsters don't have a say or don't have a place to do or carry out the activities in Nigeria anymore. It's no longer a safe haven for crime. From being a department under the Transport Ministry, the Aviation Ministry now stands alone and for good reason too. Today under President Mohamedou Buhari, this 
is how Nigeria's four busiest airports look. The Muritala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos. The Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja. Port Harcourt International Airport. And the Malam Aminu Kano International Airport, Kano. With over 5 million passengers each year passing through these four airports, the Africa Development Bank thought it made business sense to invest more in these airports and make them viable with more opportunities to explore. Before President Buhari, SleepingAirports.net ranked the Muritala Mohammed International Airport, Lagos, as the fifth worst airport in the world. Today, it is the largest airport in Nigeria and one of the busiest in Africa. With three terminals, a few kilometers from each other, two domestic and one international terminal, with more than 6.4 million passengers a year. The Namdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, has international and domestic terminals which share a common runway. Today, under President Buhari, the new airport, with better facilities, now features 72 check-in counters, 5 baggage collection carousels, 28 immigration desks at arrivals, 16 immigration desks at departures, 8 security screening points, and 8 passenger boarding bridges. The Abuja airport today can handle 15 million passengers every year, up from 3.46 million passengers in 2017. On the 25th of October 2018, President Buhari commissioned the new Potakot Airport located in Omagwa, a suburb of Potakot, with two terminals for both international and domestic flights. Prior to 2018, sleepingairports.net ranked the Potakot International Airport as the third worst airport globally, with a capacity to truly offend travelers. But the new airport commissioned by President Buhari in 2018 is different. Today it is the third busiest airport in Nigeria, serving over 1 million passengers in 2009. By 2015, the number of passengers had increased to over 1.2 million. Traditionally with low traffic to sustain it, the Malam Aminu Kano International Airport will make up in revenue once rehabilitation is done. It is the oldest airport in Nigeria and a major connection point for air travelers going from northern Nigeria to the world. It has one international and two domestic terminals, one still under construction. In 2015, the airport served over 389,000 passengers. But once the new terminal is completed, that figure is expected to rise. The airport will rely on revenue through non-aeronautical services. Don't forget that this airport serves civilian and military flights with one runway for civilians and the other serving the Nigerian Air Force at the south side of the airport. After Buhari won the elections in 2015, there was real apprehension in the oil-rich Niger Delta states regarding the survival of the presidential amnesty program initiated and promoted by the late president Musa Yaradua to quell unrest in the region. Professor Charles de Kubo, former coordinator of the presidential amnesty program, explains. When Muhammad Buhari won the elections, the fear that he was going to scrap the program, they were all unfounded because this government is so committed to the desires and aspirations of the Niger Delta people. He believed that for some time I've not been treated well by some administrations, but he believed that he will bring them and make them realize that they are co-equal with all other Nigerians and make provision for them so that there could be peace and security. Bearing in mind, the Niger Delta is where all what we clamor for in this society comes from. So definitely, that was a desire on the part of the government and administration that peace and security should be maintained in Niger Delta as well as human capital development in terms of training, providing chances for employment. People can also do things for themselves. Not government can do everything. The most important thing is the diversion of training from offshore to onshore, which has been taking a large bulk of the money from the office. This training will be done within the program into institutions linked with universities and other institutions so that they could be certificated. The highlight completion of the vocational training center at Agadagba in Ondo State. 
first class institution that our people now go to acquire knowledge on oil and gas. And if our people could have access to such employment, it could also do us well. We cannot complain that we have been marginalized. The industry is fast changing in the 21st century. You have gas now coming to be the most important resources that we have instead of oil. We are training people in these areas, like the petroleum training issue and all that, linked with Agadagba, you know, in those states. Also, we have one at Gelegele in the Edo state, close to the ocean. You can see that you have a gas plant there. Building structures in all these places is the way forward for the amnesty program. If you don't have knowledge in this 21st century, then definitely it will be difficult for you to get employment in these emerging and growing sectors. That is where our focus is. In Obama, in River State, you have this deep sea welding program. This type of knowledge is not even available in other West African countries. Students from the sub-region will come there and acquire knowledge. And that small leafy town of Obama could be bustling with foreign students coming in and also making the economy of the region bustrous. In the Benidon University, we are paying about 800 million in school fees and uh, living allowances. Just calculate that for the number of students that are there. We have even drawn down on sending students abroad. That's why we are concentrating more on universities in the country, only for very specialized courses that we don't have place for in Nigeria. That's why we send them to acquire the knowledge of the 21st century. If not, all the universities in Nigeria, they have our students there. It is initial fear that these are people from conflict-infested areas that they are not going to read and all that. I think we have turned it around to show people that they have the test for knowledge and they could acquire they could go for wherever it is and, and set and get what they want in the brief period of this program which is about 10 years they have done well for themselves and for their community most of our students when the program started there was that idea about catching up with the rest and as a result there were a lot of people sent abroad to go and acquire knowledge and they, most of them have done perfectly well in the united states a girl of outstanding ability that became first in her class in law and was called to the american bar and then she's now working in america so, after Babalola University, my delegates became the highest number of people that had first class. With hard work and a new focus to life, they could attain heights that they've not dreamt of. You can see the performance of our students with sterling qualities in all fields of endeavor that they've tried to show. People from the Niger Delta are not lazy people. They are hardworking. What they wanted was just to create a level playing field for them to key into and then attain heights that they've never attained before. Is it true that graduates of the Presidential Amnesty Program must work for the federal government when they graduate as a quid pro quo for the scholarship received? We also realize that the federal government cannot provide all employment opportunities. What the federal government is doing is to provide an enabling environment for which people can key in. Not everybody could be employed by the federal government. So if people have jobs outside where they could earn hard, hard currency and send it to their people back home, why shouldn't we allow them to do that? We have a lot of people that have been trained in the welding sector. Our recent agreement with Samsung is a key and a pointer to the future. If those jobs are done by the indigents of the Niger Delta, the spate of oil comes from my place as a result, hey, I must get, all that will die down. If most people have jobs that they can rely on, they will not even bother who rules them because they will always have something on the table for their people. And that's the direction Muhammad Buhari was taking them to. Indeed, the Nigerian Lottery Regulatory Commission under the Buhari presidency is only one of the success stories of a dynamic government actively seeking to diversify the Nigerian economy. Chief Executive Officer Lanri Bajabiamila says the revenue so far generated by the commission has not scratched the surface of what is possible. The National Lottery Regulatory Commission was set up as a revenue generating agency and has been improving gradually. Prior to my coming into office, we were generating about 400, 500. But because this industry is so peculiar, it's taking a little bit of time to have a team to meet the mandate set for us by Mr. President in terms of revenue. For the last quarter in 2017, we were able to generate a little bit over 1 billion. We saw where we had leakages. Based on that, our revenue went up. That hasn't been achieved in the last 10 years of the National Lottery Commission. As of 2019, we're close to 2 billion. Government is big. They have a lot to do for the people of Nigeria. The only little way we can support is to generate these revenues for good causes for education, health, environment, disasters, or areas as Mr. President might choose or to help wherever he chooses to. And we've been doing this all over Nigeria, in Katsina. We donated equipment to the hospital there, x-ray machines, different machines. We've done that in the east, gone to Calabar. It's a different government. We all know what the president is all about in regards to leakages, in regards to corruption. There's zero tolerance to non remittance What we went after, uh, the I don't want to mention the uh, company itself, but this was outstanding for my time. 
they coughed out about 400 million, which went to our sister agency, the Trust Fund, who are the custodians or the fund managers of our funds. That was in July, and then we did another one early September, and we recovered about 68 million from that particular organization as well. Because as regulators, we make sure they remit to government, because without those revenue, you know, what are we here for? You know, agriculture does not exist in isolation. The new government came in in the midst of financial crisis, the foreign exchange crisis, which affected everything. Knowing especially that Nigeria is an import-dependent nation, many farms and the allied organizations were in distress. But we got our acts together, the government voiced an interest in agricultural development. As part of the cardinal policy of government, they kept emphasizing that we must produce what we eat, and government made some policy adjustments that were pro-agricultural production and the government also strengthened some support initiatives like in the finance sector, in customs and import tariff and things like that to strengthen agricultural production. The implementation of the 2016-2020 Agricultural Promotional Policy has resulted in the increased production of rice and maize in the country. A total of 862,000 farmers cultivating 835,000 hectares across 16 different commodities created 2.5 million jobs. Today, according to the Africa Rice Center in Benin Republic, Nigeria is Africa's largest producer of rice, producing 4 million tons every year. Local production of rice in Nigeria saved the federal government $800 million in 2018. According to the Bank of Agriculture, Nigeria is even exporting grains now. With the ban on importation of rice by President Mohamedou Buhari, Nigeria's agriculture sector is booming. Nigeria has today overtaken Egypt as Africa's largest producer of rice. Nigeria's Ministry of Agriculture engaged in the Anka Borough program in order to achieve a target of increased agricultural lending. This enabled the state and the federal capital territory to explore their comparative advantage. The ministry also facilitated 500 threshers to rice farmers from 12 rice producing states. Ebonyi Enugu, Katsina Sokoto, Kebi Jigawa, Kano Kaduna, Niger Kogi, Benue and Taraba states. These threshers were given at 60% discount to farmers who would pay 20% within 18 months while the state governments will bear 20% of the costs. We inherited the baggage from the previous government of government thinking of agri as crops over and above animals. So each time government rules out an intervention on agricultural development, you hear of rice, tomato, and you hardly hear of pigs, chicken, well, we started hearing of cattle, whereas if we are trying to transform animal production, the first animal to think of is the chicken. That was late in the day to come. But government eventually saw reason and put in place policies to encourage production of all these animals. There's something the Buhari administration did very well that has helped livestock, particularly the poultry sector. And that was this control of smuggling. It was a major factor militating against the production of poultry products in Nigeria was the fact that our borders were too porous. As of 2015, Nigeria could not compete dollar to dollar with countries like Brazil, Vietnam, Mexico. Smuggled products from these countries had a way of undermining what was produced locally. They smuggled substandard products, which become even cheaper and as addressed to public health. The government controlled smuggling and that immediately gave a boost to the market because local producers had where to sell. Today, there is a lot of enthusiasm among those who are producing chicken. Same for those who are producing eggs in the country. People are still having issues with processing, with storage, and so we still need government to do a lot in that area. But interest by the government, access to finance, control of smuggling has improved. Those who are in it as business are finding it more interesting to participate in agricultural production. Are we where we're supposed to be? No, there's still room for improvement. The poultry industry has doubled in size in the last five years. Between 2000 and
2015 and now, this present government understands the important role that the poultry industry plays in the bigger agricultural sector and they have brought up several initiatives to further help the industry. The first one was the way the borders have been controlled. Imported poultry was cheaper from abroad. Even with all the bribes and so on they pay, that restriction alone is what is energizing poultry farmers now to enter the industry and invest more. The second thing that this government is doing is making money available cheaper to farmers. Poultry farming all over the world has lower margin. Poultry farmers cannot survive with 20, 30, 40, 50 percent interest rates per annum. And if you look at any country right now that is doing very well in terms of agriculture, the government always gets involved in some way. Just the same way our government is getting involved by subsidizing the price of petroleum product, we need the government to continue to get involved so that farmers can loan money at five, not more than seven percent interest per annum on funds. If this happens, poultry farmers will be encouraged to loan money. They will return such monies. The level of default will be so low. I think this government is doing very well. But for a turnaround to happen in the industry, it will take seven to ten years. The poultry industry went from 700 billion seven years ago, is now valued at 1.4 trillion naira. This means that the percentage of Nigeria's GDP contributed by the poultry industry alone is steadily increasing, which is a good thing. We want more of this. The intention of the Buhari presidency was clear as far as the social intervention program was concerned. Miriam Uwais, former special advisor to President Buhari on the social investment program, says the SIP is evidence of the president's focus on the poorest and the first time in Nigeria's history that 500 billion naira is budgeted for poverty. It is evident that this administration's focus was on the poorer segments of society. Over the past four years, it's been consistent. It's all about how do we support citizens who in the past have never ever felt the impact of government. Yes, people scoff at 10,000 Naira, but when you think about how happy they are in the market and you look at the entire inventory, it's not up to 5,000 Naira. People that sell corn or omo tied up or salt, they don't know where to go for money. Now they are getting loans. People don't talk about the data that is being collated for every person we give loans to. We have their profile, picture, trade, so we know where they are in the market. And all of that information is available for analysis, so we're able to plan. Surprising that in the past we've never done this, because this is so critical for us to close the disparities. The social intervention program is a win-win for everyone, children, food vendors, farmers and the value chain created testifies to that. President Buhari promised that he would do the school feeding program and now we're in 35 states and the value chain has been created in addition to the fact that children are coming back to school to the extent that some states are complaining our classrooms are too small. We're boosting their nutrition. The teachers say they're more attentive in class. Then you have the women that are being empowered. Their businesses are growing. We need almost 7.6, 7.7 million eggs every week. Imagine the poultry farmers, they now have a sustainable income, almost 95 metric tons of fish that is required every week. Don't even talk about the fruits, vegetables, chicken, palm oil, groundnut oil. Everybody is happy because they know that everything they're producing is going to be bought up. With mixed feelings, we hear stories of children hiding eggs in there uniforms or pieces of chicken because they want to take home to their siblings because unfortunately the budget only covers classes one to three in public primary schools. We hear of children not wanting to be promoted to class four because they won't get fed. There are just so many contending demands but the president has prioritized these interventions and so the money has not been reduced ever since and our releases have been growing in terms of percentages every year to accommodate the numbers that are growing. We also have an empower program for unemployed graduates and non-graduates. We have over 526,000 now that 500 graduates that are working in different fields. Over 108,000 of them have started their own businesses. We're partnering with IBM to see that they have digital skills. All of them have uh, devices, at least 200,000 of them do, and then the 300,000 that are yet to have are not being set up yet because it's all about learning as you grow. And we have the non-graduates, so we 
we've set up very close partnerships and um, the National Automobile Development and Design Council with the in, um, tourism industry. They produce manuals for us. We audited skill centers around the country and these skill centers are accommodating our non-graduates and some graduates who say the kind of training that they get in three months is not something they ever saw in university. We are creating a database in every state. That database can give you the number of widows that are poor in a community or state that have been identified by the communities that they live in. This is actually a long-term effort unlike the bridges that you can build and the hospitals and the roads and all of that because those ones are you know visible to you. So in addition to the infrastructure I am thankful that Mr. President has actually told us that you need to lift up those people so that they can engage with the inf infrastructure that is ongoing alongside what effort we are able to put through. The president has said it. poverty does not recognize political party affiliation, culture, religion, and the president of all of Nigeria. So go to every part of Nigeria where there's poverty and address it. Nigeria inherited 3,500 kilometers of rail infrastructure from the colonialists before independence in 1916. In the last quarter of 2019, what value has the Buhari presidency added to the rail system since 2015? Having become Minister for Transport, while you agree to focus on what the solutions are, you also have to understand what the problems are. The problems were mainly that the 3,500 kilometers of railway we managed to have from the Korean masters were not maintained, not just by the Good Luck Administration, but by previous uh, government. It was only under Abacha that they tried to buy some locomotives and coaches and all that. But maintenance is an issue. Even for the ones we built, if we don't maintain them, it turned to be like the narrow gauge. Uh, by the time we came, Obasanjo had already carried out uh, a survey. He's done a study on how to modernize the Nigerian railway. Uh, all we did was latch on it. Uh, the president's brief was no new contracts, complete the old ones. If we finish the old ones and there's money, then we can go for the new ones. So we, we had to complete the Kaduna Abuja rail, which President Gulag Jonathan has started. And uh, he had literally done between 70 to 80% of it. We had to pay the remaining Katapa funding and the extra work. Negotiated with the sisters of the Catholic Church whose land were to be taken for the alignment to pass through. The, and they considered that we can proceed and pay them later. Uh, that we did. So we completed that in record time and uh, commercialized it. We had to put coaches and locomotives on it. Uh, it's been running. And when we started, with, we commenced, we were running with about uh, 300 passengers. Now we're doing about 3,700 passengers per day. That's the reason why you see all these old people are standing, there's a bit of chaos, there's ticket racketeering and all that, which we think that the solution is as soon as we're able to put another 10 to 12 coaches on that track, then that will resolve that problem. So it's the problem of maintenance, poor funding. And because funding is limited, Nigeria still relies on the existing old rail tracks as opposed to building new ones. I agree that it's capital intensive, but it does a lot to the economy. It moves the economy forward, it creates employment, it solves the problem of logistics. And so the president did mandate me to look at that agreement with the Chinese and see how to progress with it. That way you're able to sustain the Obasanjo's modernization policy. So after the completion of the Kaduna Abuja, we had to proceed to Lagos and then commence to work on the Lagos Ibadan. Hopefully by January, February, we'll commence work on the Ibadan to Kano. We'll start from Kano to Kaduna and probably from Ibadan to Ilorin. Longer. The president has been very kind to us, the Minister of Transport, and to Nigerians by providing the Katapa fund. It may not be like in one first swoop like he did in 2016. Mm -hmm. Now he's gradual. I'm not an economist, but would I have the capacity to borrow? Uh, I hear the argument of the Minister of Finance that the problem is not that we over borrow, the problem is that we don't have revenue. There's revenue shortfall. However, uh, we're going to put pressure on the Minister of Finance and the president to allow us all to borrow on our behalf so that we can complete all these projects. And these projects will require about the total cost of about 36 billion dollars. That's huge. Does funding remain a critical issue? Minister since 2015 wrote to me Amechi says yes. We've completed the Kaduna Abuja. We've nearly completed the 
uh, eight Abewari. Don't forget that was abandoned for the, in the past 34 years. The stations are almost ready. That's what's holding out the communication and signal equipment are coming to the country. We hope to install them between now uh, and January, February, March. Every yard is under, under the construction. They were abandoned, in fact, they were set on fire in Enabo, the maintenance workshops and all that. So that place should be ready in the next six months. Lagos Iban is almost ready. We're going to start trial run on November the 30th. But we believe that by April and May, we should have completed all the stations and the signaling. So those ones are ready. Then we believe that if we get the appropriate funding, we should commence work on the Ibadan Tukano, and then commence work from Babuja to Itabe, passing through Baru. We are going to continue our negotiation with the Russians so that we can commence work on the Lagos Calabar. And we're also negotiating with the Chinese for the Potakot Meduguri. Potakot Meduguri is Potakot Aba, Umahia, Uwere, uh, Enugu, Abakliki, Oka, Makode, Lafia, Kwanga Jos, Auchi, Gumbi. Then you head to Yubi, Namatru, and then head to Makode. No Meduguri, rather. Then the, the Lagos Calabar is the whole of the south south. So you have Lagos coming through Akure, Benin. Then Benin, you have a spot that tees off to Abo and Asaba, and then Tunisia. And then you continue from Benin to Ueli, Wari, Inegua, Port Harcourt. Aba, Uyu, and Kalaba. That takes care of the south south, and while the Potakot Meduguri takes care of the southeast and the northeast. North central is split. Potakot Meduguri, you will find Makodi, which is in north central. You will find Jos, which is in north central. You will find even Lafia, which is also part of north central. The central line that starts from Abuja, Wari, also takes care of part of the north central. It takes care of Kogi. Even the Lagos Kano also takes care of Kwara. So the country is covered. But the problem is money which wasn't part of the modernization policy. If we can't get money enough, enough money, then we can as well borrow a bit to rehabilitate the old lines and, and we'll do, make do with it. But if we can borrow and, and build the new ones, better. Currently, what we now have, functional lines that can function, we have the Lagos Ibadan, which is about 156 kilometer. You have the Abuja Kaduna, 186 kilometer. You have the Itabe Wari, it's about 350 kilometers. So if you put all of them together now, under this government, we have a total of about 600 and something kilometers of railway. By the time we complete the Ibadan to Kano, which is about 860 kilometers, so we'll be having about a thousand plus constructed by this government, about a thousand five hundred kilometers of railway constructed by this government. We hope that the uh, next government that will take over from us will be able to do something in that regard to progress the railway. Because even if we finish Lagos to Kano, we still need to finish Lagos to Calabar, and we still need to finish Potakot to Meduguri. I hope that we are able to award it in this government, which makes it difficult for anybody to just cancel the contract. If we award it and they commence the execution, they'll be difficult for anybody to cancel it. With the triple portfolio, the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment, Minister since August 2019, Niyadi Bayo explains the President's vision. The President's vision is to get people out of poverty. The President has one driving desire, and he says it all the time, to get 100 million people out of poverty over the next 10 years. This ministry is key to that. We've established and we know that one of the easiest ways of getting people out of poverty is for them to get jobs. One of the easiest ways for people to get jobs is for there to be thriving industries within the country. So we're doing everything possible to encourage those industries industries that exist, we're encouraging them to enlarge what they have, increase their production, and we're encouraging new people to come in and set up industries. Through the Bank of Industry, a lot of money is going out to help micro, small and medium scale industries. A lot of money is going out to help young entrepreneurs, young farmers, so there's a lot of work being done. Nigerian Export Processing Zone Authority, NEPSA, established with a strategic mandate of promoting and facilitating local and international investments into Nigeria's licensed free trade zones. So far, there has licensed 39 free zones spread across the country. 14 are currently operational with 400 licensed free zone enterprises on the Buari. NEPSA has licensed five more free zones. Among these are Dangote Free Zone, valued at $12 billion, Tomaru Industrial Park in Lagos, valued at $450 million, Quits Aviation Services Free Zone, 
valued at $215 million and has attracted over $16 billion into the national economy as foreign direct investment. The whole essence of the free trade zone is it also helps in creating jobs because what happens is that when you create these zones, people come, they set up the factories with a view to exporting their goods. However, the labor that they have to use are our people here. Our people here have jobs, they pay taxes, which brings revenue to government as well. So sometimes even within the free trade zone, uh, if you want to sell your goods locally, you pay taxes on those goods that you're selling locally. So it's a win-win situation for the government. Government is making revenue, people are working, government is making revenue from the taxes that they are paying. Before Buari, the highest allocation to NEPSA was 2 billion Naira. But under President Buari, Nigeria has witnessed an unprecedented capital allocation of about 100 billion Naira to NEPSA. 50 billion Naira in 2017 and 50 billion Naira in 2018, leading to a remarkable upgrade of the infrastructure of the Calabar Free Zone and completion of construction work at the Kano Free Zone. The 2019 budget provides a possible 40 billion Naira to NEPSA. And how does the federal government monitor the effectiveness of its policy on the ease of doing business? For the ease of doing business, we have to collaborate with different ministries and state government. So we have a committee and it is the job of that committee to see that things are working out properly. We are not where we want to be. We believe that we can do better than what we have done so far and we're working hard in that direction. In harnessing their contributions, Fuari is the first Nigerian president to acknowledge and value the importance of Nigerians living abroad. And that makes him the first Nigerian president to formalize the recognition by setting up a diaspora commission headed by former senior special assistant on diaspora matters and now pioneer chairman of the commission. She says there is a lot of work to do and the World Bank agrees that Nigeria can do much more with remittance of $26 billion in 2018 alone. In as much as you say, oh, the country is this, the country is that, your diaspora should be your first line of foreign direct investment. They're investing in other countries, they're developing other economies. We are reaching out to them and it is succeeding. The World Bank says Nigeria is in the diaspora remitted $26 billion in 2018 alone. In 2017, I think it was 23, so it's been a higher remittance. This was also validated by PricewaterhouseCooper, who also said we can even do much more. There's also now a federal mortgage diaspora program. We realize that a lot of times, major problem is, oh, I'm sending money home. My brother or sister is building me a house. You don't have to do that anymore. There's a program for them where you can we work with the Federal Mortgage Bank, you can get a house you own, and you don't need a third party. As Nigerians faced xenophobic attacks in some countries, President Buhari ordered the immediate evacuation from those countries of Nigerians who wished to return home. President Buhari's leadership was made to bear during his decision to go to South Africa and actually engage South African authorities as a result of xenophobic attacks on Nigerians. And in that town hall meeting, Nigerians in South Africa got up and said, Mr. President, thank you for restoring our dignity. Thank you for coming here and thank you for showing the whole world that we do matter to you. And even receiving them from South Africa, we did everything on President's instruction. The commission was on hand at the airport to receive them. We mobilized the private sector some government agencies to see what can be done to make their return warm and welcome. Now, courtesy of MTN, they were able to get recharge cards that will last them for two months, as well as some cash support of almost about 15,000 or so. And then Airtel later gave phones so that they could have SIM cards as well as phones. NEMA was on hand to provide transportation as well as some form of money. Then the governor of Lagos State, Governor Sanwolu, for the second batch, gave each of the returnees, 20,000 Naira. So they had enough to at least go home and settle in. And then back of industry thereafter started profiling them. So the profiling was, what do you want? What do you do? And we'll give out soft loans. Well, not too much, but something to keep you going to those who have responded. We had a hospital on ground, Lumed, also South African based, but also relocated to Nigeria. We gave them free medical checkup on arrival. Then some are offering skills acquisition and training for them. So those who are interested are being contacted if you want. Thanks to President Buhari's leadership and intervention in this matter, Nigerians were united. Nigerians came up to say, you are people, we're all together, we're all one. It doesn't matter where you come from, let's support one another. Even in unexpected sectors, 
the Buhari administration is succeeding. The number one responsibility of government is the protection of its citizens and prevent exploitation. Many times we think that's really from a security standpoint, but it's as much a consumer protection issue as it is insurrection or external or territorial security issues with respect to rice. We got credible intelligence that there was some contaminated rice that was making it into the markets in the south-south region, especially in Akwa Ibom state. And I led the team to interdict this very violent smugglers. There were ships in the high seas with contaminated rice uh, that would not come through the ports. You might know that in Akwa Ibom there are about 220 creeks. There's no way for customs to police all these creeks. These smugglers would take gunboats and speedboats to the high seas, offload the rice into the boats, bring them through the creeks, and then rebag them. We struck on the same day, hitting the retail market, warehouse, and the staging area where they were cleaning dirty rice and rewashing and, and rebagging. I mean, there's no question about it that if you saw the kind of rice that they were selling to people, you would probably be concerned about eating rice again. The agency itself has become better known under President Muhammadu Buhari. First, the fact that we have a new law is verifiable. The fact that companies are far more respective of this regulator is absolutely verifiable. The fact that this organization as an agency has gained popularity far beyond what it was before is verifiable. And I'm saying that the reason why that popularity exists is not that there's a new location or there's anything new. It's really because you've got a president and a government that has supported the work of the organization and has provided the political will and the moral authority for it to do its work. And finally, President Buhari tackles the global coronavirus pandemic in Nigeria. This is not a joke. It is a matter of life and death. Mosques in Mecca and Medina have been closed. The Pope celebrated Mass on an empty St. Peter's Square. The famous Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris held Easter Mass with less than 10 people. India, Italy, and France are in complete lockdown. Other countries are in the process of following suit. We cannot be lax. In December 2019, the novel coronavirus disease broke out in Wuhan, China. By the 30th of January 2020, the World Health Organization, WHO, declared COVID-19 a pandemic. At that time, there were already over 7,000 infections globally. Now, following the entry of COVID-19 into Nigeria on the 27th of February 2020, President Buhari doubled down to mitigate the onslaught of the disease with dynamism. He had already issued an advisory of non-essential travel to and a caution about awarding visas to people coming in from China. He thereafter constituted a presidential task force, PTF, on the 9th of March 2020 to be headed by Boss Mustafa, the secretary to the government of the Federation, as chairman, with other members drawn from relevant ministries, departments, and agencies. President Buhari also approved the appointment of Dr. Sani Aliyu as national coordinator responsible for the cohesion of the different agencies involved in the process, plan for increased testing, create public awareness, lay the foundation for scientific and medical research, and most importantly, advise the federal government appropriately. Once a travel ban was imposed on people arriving from countries with coronavirus infections on the 18th of March 2020, the president gave his first COVID-19 address to Nigerians on the 30th of March, imposing a two-week lockdown in the federal capital territory, FCT, and two other states, Lagos and Ogun. By this time, there were already 131 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Nigeria. And in recognizing that the lockdown would impose hardship, he, among other actions taken, one, imposed a three-month moratorium for beneficiaries of the social investment programs, such as pharma, trader, and market money. Two, immediately disbursed food rations to vulnerable and affected Nigerians. Three, made conditional cash transfers to the poor. Four, expanded the social register by another million to 2.6 million households. Five, continued the school feeding program for children forced to stay at home by deploying vouchers for dry foodstuffs to their homes. And finally, six, 
deployed food rations to internally displaced persons in their camps. President Buhari further ordered the release of 70,000 metric tons of grains like gari, maize, millet, and sorghum from silos in Niger, Nasarawa, Adamawa, and Oshun states. He then turned his attention to Nigeria's 244 custodial centers, which were undoubtedly possible breeding grounds for the spread of COVID-19. With no admission of new intakes, no COVID-19 outbreak has occurred in the custodial centers. Following his order to decongest the centers, prisoners over 60 years old, those with less than six months to go on their sentences, and those with serious medical conditions were all released. Today, it is instructive that Nigeria now boasts of 29 molecular laboratories, up from only two in February 2020. So, while the pandemic rages, every Nigerian life loss strikes President Buhari to his core. He continues to urge all Nigerians to obey the guidelines of the NCDC, as it seems that the global COVID-19 is going nowhere anytime soon. The building blocks for prosperity are already being laid. The ambition and the vision of the president to take a hundred million people out of poverty in 10 years is very achievable. The signs of prosperity, getting people back to work, moving money around the economy, getting either to dormant sectors like mining and all of that back, agriculture back, Everybody who is working is on the step towards prosperity. And as you go on the step towards prosperity, clearly you are working away from poverty. And so, it's five years since Buhari became president. We still have three years to look forward to more real and verifiable achievements.